Can you say that with me? If we change, if we change the, way we money, the way we think about money, we can change the world. We can change the world. Thank you. Look, today we're beginning a journey that for me really began about 10 years ago. When I, as a pastor, wrestled with an issue that I was seeing um, more and more in this church and in our, in our community, and that's the increase in the rise of foreclosures. Some of you know that Prince George's County leads the state of Maryland in foreclosures, and for 10 years has done that. And uh, for years, we've gone back between number two and three in the nation, the state of Maryland, two and three in the nation in foreclosures. And some of you, either have unfortunately experienced foreclosure or perhaps you know someone who has. Has anyone here know someone who's experienced foreclosure? Well, as a pastor, I was seeing a huge uptick in the number of people encountering and experiencing foreclosure. And it really started me on this journey to want to understand the one thing that many of us think we know about, but we really don't. The, the, the one thing that is so critical and so vital to everything that we do, we assume we know what it is. We assume where it comes from. It affects almost every aspect of our lives. But we really don't have a thoroughgoing understanding of the nature, purpose, origin, and function of money. And I want to tell you, it's really quite simple, but it has been intentionally been made complex and complicated. And I want, I want you to stay on this journey with me today as we talk about the power of the public purse and the new economics of public finance. Now, some of you who are here today, you may be wondering, what does Pastor Coates, what does a preacher, a black preacher, know about economics, macroeconomics, and finance? And so, as a part of our campaign, we have an entire team of expert economists and researchers uh, that I'm sharing here on the screen. These are uh, uh, economists and researchers all around the country who are focused on the very issues that we're going to talk about today that really have transformed my life. I really believe it's going to define uh, my ministry um, for, the rest, for the rest of my ministry because as a leader and a pastor, I'm concerned about how do we make the world a better place for all people. Not just some people, not just some of us, not just the rich and the wealthy, but how do we make the world a better place for everyone? That's my heart. That's what drives me. That's what animates my call to ministry. And so these individuals are a part of our advisory council for our money campaign. But as we get started, I want us to do something that we don't often do. I want us to just dream about the world that we would desire to have. Dreaming is critical. Dreaming is important. We even say in our faith tradition that without a vision or a dream, what happens? People perish. People perish. Harriet Tubman says, always remember you have within you the strength, the patience, the passion, to reach for the stars, to literally change the world. Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of a dream. Victor Hugo said, each person, each man, each person, each woman, boy, girl, should frame life so that at some future hour, fact and his dreaming come together. Malcolm Forbes says, when you stop dreaming, when you cease to dream, what happens? And so I want us to dream. I want you to just imagine the kind of world you would desire us to have. And in this world, I want you to imagine a world in which every person, regardless of race, gender, class, religion, country of origin, sexual orientation, was guaranteed a dignified job with benefits. That's the one thing that many people don't know that Coretta Scott King fought for. She fought for full employment, uh, full employment guarantees in America. Sadie Alexander, the country's first black uh, uh, economist, first black female economist, fought for a federal job guarantee in the 40s. And uh, Coretta Scott King was fighting for that uh, in the 70s. Imagine a world 
where quality, low cost, with quality, quality health care, low cost health care. Imagine a world where people had sufficient money to pay their bills. Imagine that, tell you, imagine that. Imagine having all of the resources, all of the money you need to pay your mortgage, your rent, your utilities, I don't know, everything. Uh, college tuition for your child. Uh, for that matter, imagine having free public college. Tell the neighbor on the other side, imagine that. Imagine having well-equipped community centers, high-quality public schools, and not just some communities, but every community. Imagine having reliable public transportation, dependable social security. Imagine a world in which businesses could thrive because the American people would have less credit, less debt, and more money to purchase the things they need. Imagine a world where there was less social and economic tension. My goodness, all of the tension, the hatred, the bigotry, the animosity that we're seeing today. Imagine a world where there is less social and economic tension between people of different races and backgrounds as a result of being forced to compete for insufficient resources. Imagine that kind of world. Imagine a world in which there was shared prosperity rather than an economy in which much of the population is chronically left behind. Now here's the kicker. Imagine us doing all of that without raising taxes to fund spending or worrying about the one thing that politicians tell us we need to be worried about, the federal debt and deficits. Imagine that world. Now, have I left out anything? When you think about the world that you would like to have, uh, a future where there's peace and prosperity, has, have I left anything out when you think about the kind of world that you would like to see? Anyone have any, anything you want to add to this? Or when you think about the world, if money were not an issue, let me ask, if money were not an issue, how would you use money to solve one social and economic issue that you care about? Anyone? Yes. I would get rid of the student loan debt. Yes. It's keeping so many of our young people down, she said. And you saw Brianna, you saw Brianna Garza in the video say that she had how much debt? After 130000 dollars worth of debt. Yes. Awesome. So she said she would like to see a world in which politicians were free from having to raise money from us or corporate interests or special interests and could run uh, free of that sort of monetary interest. What about a world where there's not so much gentrification? Where, because everything that I'm talking about 10 years ago as I'm thinking about the foreclosure crisis, we're seeing so much gentrification in our area and all around the country where D.C. is looking a little different. Harlem, Chicago, L.A., West End, in Atlanta, right? Um, and, we have, and we're seeing people who have uh, come up in communities now being displaced, right? Um, so, and so there are many other things. Anyone else? A mass guest. Better resources for mental health. I suspect that if we, yes, let's get this last comment here. More domestic violence. Because um, we don't really have, I think we have maybe uh, one here in Christian. Uh, well, no, we have maybe a few. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm listening. If you just had to imagine, imagine a world where you didn't have to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week just to keep the lights on. No, like I, when I say imagine a world, 
I really mean stretch your mind. I mean, imagine a world where you have more leisure time. And not after you retire, but when you're 25, when you're 35, when you're 45, not having to work 50 hours a week, putting together uh, two and a half part-time jobs just to, I mean, like, when I talk about imagine a world, I really mean let your imaginations really, you know, the sky is the limit, all right? Now. If we were to establish a nation today, the topic we're going to talk about today, as I said, it's really at the core, it's very simple, but the interests who profit from the issue we're coming to talk about today have intentionally made it very obscure and confusing. And I've taken a lot of time, probably eight, nine, or ten years, trying to figure out how to crystallize all of these very complex concepts into language that people can get. Because it affects our everyday lives. It affects the schools we have in our neighborhoods, the roads and infrastructure we have. When we get sick, people are going into bankruptcy literally because of a sickness that they encounter. It affects our everyday life. And we cannot afford to just allow, you know, the chairman or the chairwoman of the Federal Reserve or some any the elite academic institutions of academia to only understand the one thing that affects our lives. So I want us to imagine that we are establishing a nation right now. Let's imagine for a moment that we're establishing a government. And let's call that nation Wakanda. <laughs> All right, can we do that? Is that okay? I mean, just for illustrative purposes, just for illustrative purposes, let's call this nation, this community that we're gonna establish Wakanda. And in our nation, we want to have all of the things that you just mentioned. Great public schools, great resources, great health care, great roads and infrastructure. We want a community that where people, regardless of age and ability, have an equal place at the table. I mean, on all of these great, wonderful things that we just imagined, we want all of that in Wakanda, right? Right. right? Now, in order for us to have great schools, for pe people and families to have resources to thrive and, and survive, we have to create it. We've got to build the schools as the nation and the government that we're going to establish right now. We're going to establish great communities, thriving neighborhoods, great schools, great hospitals, great health care. And so in order for us to have all of these wonderful things, what do we need? And so if we establish Wakanda right now, the nation of or the kingdom of Wakanda, whatever you want to call it, in order to get the money, right, we need money to fund these things, right? right. So they tell us we need money to fund these things. So let's say now, at this particular time, at 2, 4, 10, 14, uh, in order to obtain the money, you know, we decide, let's say we have a council, we decide that we're going to tax you, the citizens of Wakanda, to give us Wakanda dollars so that we can build the schools. And then let's say we turn to those of you in the business community for investment so that you can invest in, I don't know, some public-private partnership so that we can have public transportation, those of you who are business owners. And then those of you who lead financial institutions and who have, you know, who are committed to, to your faith, who are committed to making the world a better place. We appeal to you and your benevolence and your altruism to give charity and to give back, to give back to help us have many of the things that you desire. <coughs> now, let me ask, if we establish the nation of Wakanda, the government of Wakanda at 1015, <coughs> are you all able to give the taxes is the business community able to make public investments? And is the faith community able to extend charity in order for us to have these great things in Wakanda at 10 16? No. How many of you say yes? <coughs> say yes? Okay. 
Because we need Wakanda dollars now. We need Wakanda dollars. How many of you say no? How many of you are a bit ambivalent? I don't know where he's going. <laughs> Those of you who say no, why do you say no? Why do you say that if we set up Wakanda at 1015, we're not able to generate tax revenue at 1016, and the business community is not able to invest, and the faith community is not able to give charity. Why are we not able to do that? Say that. I haven't had any customers. Okay, a little deep. That's a little deep. It's very basic. Very basic. Like if you get this, yes. Interesting. Okay, that's not what we're, where we're going. Yes. Yeah. It's because you have to deal with the paperwork. And paperwork. Have to, yeah. Okay. We're coming around the mountain. You say yes. There's no will in their sphere. Okay, let me get to Let me just put you all out of your misery. Listen. The topic we're talking about today, you have to really check all of your assumptions about this topic at the door. For the next hour and a half, you have to be willing to check all of your assumptions about this topic, money, at the door. Are you with me? Yes. The reason I, we would not be able to tax, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> stand, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Say it loud. You haven't created the money yet. Did you all hear that? Okay. If we establish the kingdom government of Wakanda at 1014, I cannot, the government cannot tax you at 1016, and the business community cannot make investments and have a public-private partnership, and the faith community cannot engage in charity because we have not created the Wakanda dollar yet. It's a very fundamental, foundational principle of modern monetary theory. That money is a creature of the state. Money is not a creature of private citizens, a creation of the business community. That money is a creature of the what? State. And if we establish a nation, the state or the government has to create the money first, has to spend the money first in order for there to then be revenue and taxes and things of this nature. So the basic point, foundational point is in order for us to have the world that we just imagined, the government has to do the one thing that you and I cannot do. You and I cannot create money as individuals in order to spend. I mean, if you do, you'll go to jail. <laughs> but the government can do what you and I can do. It has the power of money creation. It has to spend the money first in order for there to be money. It has to create money, and it has to create enough money for there to be an adequate money supply so that there can be schools, roads, jobs. There has to be public investments in all of the things that we have all talked about today. Are y'all with me? Is that one principle understood? So it establishes the first principle that taxes do not fund spending. Okay? Now, this is different at the state level and at the local municipal level. But at the federal government level, taxes don't fund spending. Spending has to come first. All right? That's very important. And it's the obligation and responsibility of the government to create enough money to supply us with an adequate money supply in Wakanda or whatever nation we're in. If we have a sovereign issue of our own currency, we have to create all the money we need to solve all of our greatest challenges. And here's the good news. The good news is, is that dreams can come true. Dreams can come true. 
that if I were to ask you whether it were possible for all of the wonderful things we described earlier were possible, you would say, that's not realistic. That probably could not happen. That's really utopian. But I want to tell you, it really can happen. It is possible. It is possible for us to have an economy that works for all of us. So the question is, what's the holdup? Why are we not doing it then? If it is possible for us to have a community of opportunity, great schools in every neighborhood, uh, health care for everyone, uh, free public college, uh, wiping out college debt, why are we not happening? Why is it not happening? That's a very good question. You see, look at that corner over there. You see that pink elephant in that corner over there? <laughs> That pink elephant in the room is why we are not able to have the community of opportunity. And you want to know what that pink elephant is? It is the one question that is the hurdle for policymakers and the public. Whenever we start talking about why can't we rebuild Clinton Grove Elementary School and make it a, a first century school? Why can't we build, rebuild all of our schools and fix our roads and infrastructure, have 21st century public transportation, provide a good job with benefits, all of these? Why, can we, why can't we have a Green New Deal, a federal job guarantee, fix our environment, get off carbon, and get on a green, green energy? What is the first question? Why can't we wipe out the $2 trillion of, of, of student loan debt? What is the one question that politicians are going to ask? How are we going to pay for it? Where's the money going to come from? That is the central question of public finance. Where is the money for all of this stuff going to come from? Now, I'm going to tell you, as we walk through this, I said a moment ago, you really have to suspend all of your assumptions, everything you've been told about where the money is going to come from. Because we are always told that the money for rebuilding schools, providing jobs, Medicare for all, protecting Social Security, has got to come from someone's taxes. Typically. Other times they may talk about investment from the private sector. That, that's what today's conversation is talking about. I want to answer the question of where is the money going to come from so our young people, our community, our nation, and our world can have greater opportunities where people are not saddled and riddled with tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. I remember when I got out of graduate school uh, having a friend, and when she finished graduate school, she had $200,000 worth of school loan debt. And so today's conversation seeks to answer that, that question from the perspective of modern monetary theory. It is something that's been, it is, a, it, is, it is an approach to understanding public finance, government finance that has been in the news, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, it's been on all of the television shows. It is oftentimes associated with, um, with activists on the left, but there are also commentators who have regarded themselves as fiscal conservatives who are, all, who are beginning now to understand the importance and the power of thinking differently about the money system. The House Public Budget Chairman, a fiscal conservative, a longtime fiscal conservative, John Yarmouth, recently said, it sounds like there's a lot of validity to it. That's monetary theory. And just a few weeks ago, Mitch Mulvaney of this administration said the U.S. soaring debt is not holding us back. It's a basic foundational concept in modern monetary theory. Now, when we start thinking about this question, where's the money going to come from? How are we going to pay for it? It makes sense, doesn't it, on the one hand, to ask where's the money going to come from? And we think that way because in our households, when you spend, you need a source of revenue to spend, right? Are y'all here today? I mean, no one goes to the grocery store. Well, I, mean, I guess that's what credit is. I guess that's a form of payment. But generally, in order for you to spend, when you do your household budget, you need some revenue first, right? right. 
and uh, it's generally regarded as fiscally irresponsible to spend more, Sister Pryor, than you have coming in. Like right. that is like a no-no right. in your household, in your business, in your organization. If you want to find the quickest path out of leadership in an organization, start spending more than you have coming in. Yeah. Right? Very critical and very important because in your household, you need revenue first. And that mindset leads to this foundational, conventional understanding. It suggests that therefore, because your household, your business, uh, your organization needs revenue to spend, the government must need revenue as well. I need y'all to hold on to me. The government needs revenue as well. And how does the government generate revenue? Taxes, borrowing, private investment. That if we want to have roads, we got to tax someone. If we want to rebuild our schools, we've got to what? tax someone. Mm -hmm. If we want to fix our communities, we got we to have some kind of fees or taxes or perhaps we need some kind of private investment in order for us to have new roads. I was talking to someone the other day and thought it was a great solution to have private, in, private entities going to these public-private partnerships. We think that the money has got to go somewhere. And because it is fiscally irresponsible at the household level for you to be in deficit, People assume that the federal government should not want to run, run a what? Tell you, hold on. I need you to hold on, right? Since it is irresponsible for business to be in deficit, since it is irresponsible for your household to be in deficit, it is assumed, according to mainstream conventional economic thinking, that the government should never run a deficit. That if the government runs a deficit, it's the worst thing that can happen. And I want to share this video with you that shows how elected officials, left, liberal, and conservative, Republican, and Democrat, use this same mindset about a concern about deficits to underutilize, to address how we ought to provide public uh, opportunities and public things. You're going to hear a series of talking points that I want to play with you right now. is turning us into slaves. You might well literally lock us into chains, at least our children. We've got to deal with this big long-term debt problem, or it will deal with us. And uh, it is a, uh, I think it's a, I think it is, it is a... <laughs> Join us to stop this fiscal trailer. Join us to protect our children from an inferior standard of living, from a crushing burden of debt. Okay. I don't believe in any of the tax cuts. I know what tax cuts works. I mean, a lot of them middle class. Okay, you know why? Because it puts a $400 million on the budget, we just can't afford it. And as we discuss deficit reduction, which is clearly a major issue, for decades, we have piled deficit upon deficit, mortgaging our future and our children's future. And the deficit thing is real, and the debt thing is real. We are really in trouble on it at some point. Our need for comprehensive deficit reduction. The answer is... $20 trillion. The nation's going to collapse. The world is going to end. That's going, you know, we've heard all of these talking points. 
time and time again. And while this how we're going to pay for a question, these preoccupations with fiscal responsibility make sense at the household level. The problem is they do not make sense at the federal government level because of this one reason. The government is not a household. It's like the first starting point, starting premise of, of modern economics, that the government can do what you and I can't do. And so the government is not a household. It is the sovereign issue of the currency. So the government can and should create all the money that is needed to provide us with an adequate money supply. Remember our Wakanda demonstration? How is the money going to get into circulation? It has to what? It has to create the money. If it does not create the money, businesses can't, can't exist, can't thrive. There are no public services. There are no, there's no public infrastructure. And so the federal government, because it is the sovereign issuer of the dollar, right, does not need to generate revenue through taxes or borrowing, borrowing in the form of issuing treasuries, and I don't want to go into this too much, it does not need to do that in order to spend. And just create the money. Right? I've been hearing the last few days that there's been this saber rattling between this guy in the White House and Iran. And God forbid if we have to go to war. I do not want this, of course. But if we were to go to war tomorrow, this is a hypothetical, they would not tax anyone first. Are y'all with me? They would not say, we need to tax the millionaires and the billionaires in order to fund the war. Right. What would they do? They just raise the money. It's just a digital engine into a computer. <laughs> we laugh, but that's it. These are digital entries into the accounts of the various departments. You create the money by public spending. No one's going to be taxed in order to do. Very important foundational concepts and principles that I want to share with you today. Now the benefit of relying on money created by uh, the government, why it's preferable to other forms of money creation, and there are, is because public money does not have to be repaid with perpetual interest. And there are serious benefits of that. And also, as a sovereign government, here's the one thing I need you to get. The United States of America cannot go broke. The United States of America can never become insolvent unless there is a political decision, unwise decision, that will cause it to do so. If you have debts and you don't pay those debts, I don't know, you might get locked up or something. But all of the obligations of the federal government can get paid because it's got one power. That's the power of the public purse. So these are, and so that changes the game when it comes to all of the various assumptions that we talked about. Um, I, I don't want to talk about the, the gold standard, but there was a time when our money system was on the gold standard, which caused there to be a lot of constraints in how the government perceive uh, its spending. I mean, have you heard of the gold standard? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, so what was the gold standard? The gold standard was that era when those pieces, those green pieces of paper that you had in your wallet, the theory was, that the, the practice was that those green pieces of paper were backed by what? Gold. And since gold is a scarce commodity, you can't create too much of the pieces of paper because if people show up at the bank and want gold, the system will crash. And so the, the ability of the government to, to spend and invest on public priorities was constrained under the gold standard. But we went off of that in 1971, okay? So here's the foundational point, and I really need to get you to get this. The federal government can responsibly create all of the money we need. Someone say all of the money. All, all of the money we need on public priorities to provide us with an adequate money supply. 
Inflation is our only constraint. And that is, and that is creating too much money. When I say all of the money we need, I literally mean all. It has the ability to power to responsibly create all of the money we need. If, at the, if the federal government said, you know what? We don't want schools in our nation, public schools, to be over 30 years of age. Every school building over 30 years of age, we want to rebuild it. I mean, if we, can rebuild, if we have to rebuild the Georgia Dome, because it's no longer meeting its services and needs after being in operation for like 25 years, then certainly as a nation, we might prioritize school buildings over ballparks. And we might say, you know what? We want to build, we want to rebuild Crossland, Surrattsville, Clinton Grove. And rather than having to tax you and you and you and you, we're just going to make it a national priority that all schools, buildings over 30 years of age, we're going to modernize and rebuild. And where is the money going to come from? We don't want people to get sick and have to become bankrupt. We're going to have what most other developed nations have, which is a universal health care system. We want, to, we, want to, we, want to have, we want to modernize our waterways and streams, our technology. And everything we dreamt of earlier, it can happen. It can happen. The federal government has the power, the ability to create all of the money we need to provide us with an adequate money supply on public priorities, telling people, wow, we can have all of the money we need. Now here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. If the federal government underutilizes the power of money creation, if it doesn't create enough money, what ends up happening is it forces the public to rely on private money, private credit. Are y'all here? So if, if the adequate money supply requires, this is just for conceptual illustrative purposes, if an adequate money supply so that people can, can survive and have uh, food and clothes and uh, housing, uh, public schools, uh, health care, if that requires, let's say, 100% of money in circulation, but if the federal government only creates 10% of the money, Where's that other 90% come from? Where? Private sources of money. Because there are two ways. You remember in the video that money can be created through government spending or bank lending. I need y'all to get that. I need y'all to get that. If the government underutilizes the power of money creation, if it doesn't create enough money, if it doesn't, if it doesn't understand its role in the context of providing us with an adequate money supply for healthcare, schools, business development, growth and opportunity, because it's constrained by this gold standard period that no longer exists, if it underutilizes the power of money creation, it forces the public to rely on private sources of credit to meet its needs. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Now, now, here's the one thing that I really want you to get. The question is, how does the government create money? How does the government create the money? Well, it creates money using a practice that when you hear it, it seems negative, but it's really positive. And there's a foundational principle of modern monetary theory. Because remember how I said in your household, being in deficit is bad? Remember that? In, your in the church, being in deficit is bad? Trustees are at least saying man right there. <laughs> in your business, being in deficit is bad? Well, at the federal government level, that is not the case. Because the rules of the game are different. And I want to explain to you right now why that is the case. Tamara Brown, do you mind coming to the front? I am literally putting you on the spot. 
This is Tamara Davis Brown, one of our very active community organizers and activists in our community. I want to do a demonstration that illustrates how the government creates money. Let's say I am the, the I symbolize, I represent the government. And what's the name of our nation? <laughs> All right, so I symbolize the government. And let's say Tamara Davis Brown performs, she works for the government. Let's say she's a teacher and I spend $200 with her for the work that she has performed. It's a public function, it's a public need, and I spend $200 with her as payment. Now, to tax, in order to tax, because she now got, I, she now has money to pay her taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And the reason governments tax in part is because it gives money its value, right? So if there was no, if, if, if people didn't have to pay their taxes, money would not have its value. So I spend, 200, and let's say just for illustrative purposes, I tax out 100. Okay, please give me back my $100 in taxes. Now, it's a very basic principle. If I, if I, if I am now balancing, if I am now not balancing my budget, if I am now looking at my budget as the government, am I in deficit? I'm the government now. How many of you say, no, I'm not in deficit? How many of you say, yes? How many are like, I don't even know where you're going. <laughs> like, it's okay, this is okay. I need you to get this. Like, this is foundational stuff here. Like, we're covering a lot in this section today that many people and economics departments and classes do not, do not get. Politics do not get. And you're getting it today. Let's start all over. If I spend, what is a deficit? When you spend more, you spend more than you bring in. So I'm spending 200 and I'm taxing out 100. Am I in deficit? Yes. It's okay. What is a deficit? I'm the government. I'm spending 200. I'm going to tax out 100. Am I in deficit? Yes. But you can just make it. Let me get this understanding from one of our financial experts here. Okay, Sister Gina Pryor, head of our financial matters, money matters ministry. Am I in deficit as the government? Why not? Oh, I spent, so I'm not in deficit. Okay, all right. She says no. Anyone says, has a different thought. How many of you say yes? Yes, yes, your thought. Am I in deficit? I am one. So, yes, very, very good. So, contrary to, pop, well, this is generally assumed, that's what a deficit is. Deficit spending is when the government spends more than it brings in taxes. That's what deficit spending is. So technically, I am in deficit. I am in deficit because I spent 200, I created 200, spent it with her, brought in a hundred. That's a, that's a government, federal government deficit. Now, now that you have a hundred, what can, she can do stuff with her hundred. She could, she can uh, buy some candy, some apples. She can, I don't know today, I don't know how much hundred is like that, a lot. We can buy some school supplies. You know, whatever you want. And the more I deficit spend, she has more what? Money. 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 Okay, now, let's say I'm the government and my budgeting principle is to be in balance, to have a balanced budget. Are y'all with me? Yes. So I spend 200 and because I want to be fiscally responsible, I've been campaigning around the country, you know, uh, 
on fiscal responsibility. I want to balance the budget. I want to pass a balanced budget amendment. I tax out 200 so that my books can be balanced. Now, she still needs to buy some school supplies. She still needs to get housing. She still needs to buy the things that she needs. If she gets sick, she may need to buy some medication. How is she going to buy that now? She has to borrow it. She has to borrow it. Now, let's say I want to be in surplus. This was a big thing that Clinton championed in the 90s. Everybody, oh, Clinton got us in a surplus. I pay to, I spend 200. And because I want to be in surplus, I want people to be like, oh man, he's the greatest leader. He's the greatest guy. I mean, I tax out 205. So my books can show that I'm in surplus. So please, can you play your taxes? She's gonna have to borrow. She's gonna have to borrow. I might have to go into her savings if I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> All of that. And during, during the 90s, when we had this huge surplus, it was the time when private household debt was going through the roof. Because people had to buy, you know, pay their mortgages, pay their bills. So here's the point of the economics for public finance. When the, when the government sector is in deficit, the private sector is in surplus. Okay? It's called sector balances, and they're opposite operations, and I'll show that to you in a moment. So we actually want the government to create money through deficit spending, because look at the first bullet on the screen. Deficit spending, thank you. Deficit spending is net public money creation. It creates money. It spends the money on schools, roads, jobs, health care, investments. It make, it's called investment spending. One of the gentlemen here yesterday uh, from one of our elected officials' offices said it, it would help people better understand it, even though it is deficit spending, if they thought it would be more in terms of investment spending. It's money creation. You create money, you spend, and then you generate taxes. The net. It's money crazy. She has got money. And you want the government to deficit spend. And whenever politicians are walking around saying, we don't want deficits, that's, you should hear that as what the financial sector actually wants. Because when the government underspends, you have to rely on more credit. Let me see if I can play with you play for you a video from Professor Randall Ray, professor of economics at Bard College and senior scholar at the Levy Institute um, about this very same topic. Then we'll play the video from Stephanie Kelton. She's an American economist, professor of public policy and economics at the Stony Brook University, one of two of the main sort of thought leaders for the last 30 years in helping people understand money and coming to finance. Do we have that? Let's get the sound. Cool. The sound is not on. We collect the taxes. Because you can't pay your taxes until you've got the dollars. If the dollars come from government spending, the government needs to spend before you pay your taxes. So logically, the government doesn't spend taxes. Logically, the government spends so you can pay taxes. The spending has to come first. What that means is taxes actually help finance government spending. The sovereign government that issues its own currency cannot be revenue constrained because it issues the dollars as it spends. If it wants to spend more, it issues more currency. It can't be revenue constrained. Uh, it can't run out of its own currency. If you issue your own currency, you can't run out. Uncle Sam can't run out of his own currency. 
He never needs to borrow his own currency. And in fact, if you think about it, borrowing your own currency would make no sense. It does face constraints. The main constraint it faces is the resource constraint. It can run out of resource supply. It can push up the prices of resources. So, too much government spending can cause inflation. That's people long argue. But it can't cause insolvency. It can't cause insolvency of the government. It can't cause the government to run out. So the fourth point is, there is no solvency risk for a government that issues its own currency. There is no possibility of bankruptcy. When President Obama tells us that the U.S. government has run out of currency, he is misinformed. It can't happen. The U.S. government can always issue more. It's not possible to run out. There's no chance that running budget deficits, spending more than tax revenue, is going to bankrupt the United States government. It can't happen because we can always issue more. We can always make all payments as they come due. Let's get to the other clip with Stephanie Kelton real quick, right after this. So it was a fixed exchange rate gold standard system, and it was in place from 1944 all the way up until 1971 when President Nixon took the U.S. off of gold. Okay, so what I think has happened is that we, especially within economics, the textbooks were written and popularized, especially in the 50s and 60s, Samuelson's textbook, okay? And those textbooks were written, and the theories were written, and the models were designed for an economy that had fixed exchange rates. And then in the early 1970s, we changed the monetary system completely, but we didn't bother to rewrite the textbooks. So we kept telling the same stories and using the same models and so forth, and it left us thinking that we had less policy space available. Because look, if you're on a gold standard, and you're promising to convert dollars into gold at a fixed price, you have to be pretty darn careful about how many dollars you spend into existence because people might want to convert to gold. And there is only so much gold. So once you start running out of your gold reserves, you compromise the whole monetary system. So we chuck that thing, only we didn't get it out of our heads. And we act as if we are still hamstrung by those same constraints that exist under a gold standard. And the truth is, in the modern era, where we are today, we need the federal government to run deficits almost all the time. Okay, and that's really controversial. It doesn't sound fiscally responsible. The deficit hawks definitely do not think this is fiscally responsible. Deficits all the time? What do you mean? The government should never spend a dime more than it takes in in taxes. It should balance its budget in every fiscal year. Have a constitutional amendment to ensure that that happens. Extreme fiscal conservative, fiscal hawks. And I think we need a brand new bird because the others are not getting us where we ought to be and where we could be, which is at our potential, right? They're holding us back. Why do I choose the owl? Obviously, deficit an owl is very wise. Owls are uh, well known to be able to see in the dark so they can see things the others can't. Their little heads go all the way around so they can see stuff the other guys are missing. They can look at the problem from a different vantage point. This is a big advantage, right? Deficit owls want to balance the economy, not the budget. Okay, the priority is just different. What good is a balanced government budget if you wreck your economy to get there? Do you feel good about the fact that the government's deficit has been falling at the fastest pace since the end of World War II? That's a real achievement. Not if you have a junky economy. Right? So the goal should be balancing the economy. This is a graph using actual U.S. data that just shows the relationship between the government's budget and all of our budgets. It is the balance sheet position of the government on the bottom. Below zero is a deficit. Above zero is a surplus. 
And what it shows, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one because I left out the foreign sector here, but I think it makes an important and striking point, which is as government deficits get bigger, which means this red line is diving down, that's government going into deficit. That's Look what's happening above. Spending. Spending. Private sector is moving Private way up into surplus. Yeah. When government deficits fall, go back here. Government deficits fall almost to balance there. What happens to the private sector surplus? It falls almost to zero. We tend to move in opposite directions. Their deficits help to produce our surpluses. So anybody who's out to attack the government deficit without knowing it maybe is attacking private sector surpluses, which we all know no one in their right mind would support reducing private sector surpluses if they understood that that's what they were doing by championing reduced government deficits. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the main takeaways from all of this? Well, the first is we have the ability right now to solve some of our greatest social and economic crises and challenges right now. We can address mass incarceration, get homeless people off the streets. We can build first century schools, transportation, address the environment. The American Society of Civil Engineers says we have about a $4.3 trillion infrastructure. Need American Society of, of, Enge of Engineers, Civil Society of Engineers. Well, we have the potential to create more jobs and opportunity in, in the trillions of dollars. The implications are truly enormous. And the pay for for these public priorities is by creating the money for it. That's the major takeaway. So we see many politicians today talking about um, eliminating college loan debt. You hear that? Uh, you hear politicians championing Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, federal job guarantee. Um, uh, the president and members of the Democrat leadership met the other day. They talked about a $2 trillion infrastructure plan. And the question is always what? How are we going to pay for it? Should we take the money from the Social Security Trust Fund? It's got to come from somewhere, right? Maybe we should take it from the Should we tax, you know, other than we ought to tax the millionaires and the billionaires? People like that? Oh, Jeff, hey, Amazon. They're not paying any taxes. We need to tax the millionaires and the billionaires. We need to tax the ultra trillionaires, whatever, in order to pay for the spending. And while there are reasons to tax, taxes don't fund spending. Mm -hmm. We saw that in the example earlier. Mm -hmm. The way we pay for it is to create the money for it. Just create the money for it. If there's a need, if there's a war tomorrow, how are we going to fund it? Create the money for it. All we have to do is to change the way we think about money. The problem is, while the nation went off of a gold standard in 1971, policymakers and mainstream economists did not change their way of thinking about money. So you might be wondering, preacher, if all of this stuff is true, if it is possible to, for all these dreams to come true, why are we not doing it? Why then is there not more public spending to address our environmental crisis and climate change? Why are we not creating all of these? If we really can do all of this and rebuild all, you know, America's schools, if we had the public will, create a good job with benefit for every benefit for every person who wants, why are we not doing it? It is because, as I said a moment ago, the financial sector benefits when the public relies on credit for money rather than relying on money created without interest through public spending. Y'all get that? There are some of the biggest lobbyists in Washington. I believe you mentioned something about when you talk about envisioning a world, you said, I wish that politicians could lead us without having to be concerned about 
where that money is going to come from. Some of you remember five years ago, I ran for lieutenant governor, one of the greatest experiences of my life. But the one thing that I loathed was sitting in this small room, seven by nine, five or six days a week for like eight or nine hours with a 20-year-old college staffer <laughs> dialing for dollars. So politicians call it dialing for dollars. I mean, they were giving me lists of people I went to school in elementary school. <laughs> They had, they had researched my little league baseball team and found the players on the team. And any, uh, I went to an HC, HBCU, so they called people who just have, I went to HBCUs. I'm like, I don't know these people. Because <laughs> we were dialing for dollars. Now imagine if you're running for office and you don't have to call hundreds of people a day. You just get a big check from a major donor. And all you have to do is just support their messaging. All you have to do is kind of support their, you know, interest. Well, the reason we are not engaged in this kind of robust uh, public money creation to solve our greatest challenges is because the financial sector benefits from our ignorance about money. It benefits from the way in which it mystifies money. I know many of you have dozed off in the hour so that we've been here already. It's like, what is it talking about? What are all the implications of all of this? It benefits from our public confusion about the very thing that affects all of our lives. It benefits from that confusion. You can go all of your life from K through 12 through college and graduate school and never learn about money. And it can make us like that man in Plato's allegory of the cave. Plato talked about this man who was chained in a cave. And in that cave, he was facing the back of the cave. And whenever the sun came up, his shadow was cast on the back of the cave. And after being in the darkness his entire life, his, that is his entire life, he thought that the shadow was the reality. Until one day, the chain was broken. And he was able to come outside, and he was able to realize that the very thing he thought was real was not real. So the reason we are not doing all of these wonderful things so that we can have a better quality of life is because the financial sector benefits from our ignorance. And it benefits from the government's underutilizing of the power of money creation. Now, much of what we think of and use as money is not created through public spending or government spending. It's created through private lending. Some experts have said that almost 90% of our money supply is bank money, bank credit. And that bank credit has to be repaid with what? Interest. 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 And so you might ask, well, what in the world is wrong with that? What's wrong with having that kind of society where we rely on bank money? What's wrong with that? Well, let's go back to Wakanda. Are y'all all right? Yeah. Let's go back to Wakanda. Like, I really need you to get this, y'all. Like, I really need you to press yourself to stay up for the next few moments. <laughs> because the question is, what is wrong with having an economy that relies on bank money? Isn't money, money, isn't all money the same? Money, your money, my public money, isn't it all the same? Well. Some of you who have been with me before sort of remember this example we've done before. But I want us to imagine we're on a deserted island. Let's call it Wakanda. <laughs> we're on this deserted island. And on this deserted island, when we're shipwrecked there, we do a variety of things. Uh, we perform a variety of tasks in order to survive. Some hunt, some fish, some cook, some are, take are medical professionals, some teach. Uh, some are artists, you know, they sing for the community at night because we need arts and culture. 
everyone does a variety of things on the island of Wakanda. And after a while, we realize that in our attempts to exchange goods uh, for one another, in this kind of barter system and relationship, you, you know, one person may have eggs and they may need, you know, fish, but the person who has the fish may not want the eggs. And so what we decide is we need money so that money can be the medium of exchange for the exchange of goods and services and the settlement of obligations, because that's all money is. And money can be anything you want it to be. It can be pieces of paper, it can be rocks, it can be shells. Throughout history, people have used tally sticks, animal skins, sugar, money can be, it's all it is, is what you're gonna use as the medium of exchange for the performance of goods and services. Yesterday in our meeting, there's a group in College Park and they use hours for money. So they have a local currency, they use hours for money. You pay in hours. So if you're an attorney, another person's a babysitter, you pay in hours. And an hour is an hour. They value everyone's hour the same. So anyway, that's a little different topic. But anyway, on the island of Wakanda, in order for us to survive and thrive, we need what? Exchange money. So we have a community meeting, right? We have a government meeting. It's a community meeting to decide how we're going to get money for our economy. Because it's for us, right? So there are three ways in which we can get money. Three ways we can get money. Option number one, the community creates the money, and we pay people when they do work for the community. So if you're a doctor, you know, you do work for the community, and you know, it's decided that this is a public need that we have. Someone builds roads, builds huts, cooks, cleans, whatever. We, we we're going to create something. We're going to create the money. We are going to. It's the community because it's our money, right? It's our money. It's for us. It's the community's money. So option number one, we create the money, pay people for work they perform for the community. Option number two, the community creates the money, and we just give everybody an equal number of shells. We give everyone an equal amount of money, all right, regardless of what you do. That's option number two. Option number three is we say, one of, the, one of the guys in the community, he raises his hand in the community meeting, and he says, you know what? I'd be willing to create the money for the community if you all just pay me a small fee. Let's call it interest. I'd be willing to do that. I, I, I'd be willing to work. by creating what you all use as money. As long as you just pay me a little fee, you know, for my hard labor, right? Now let me ask you a question. I want you to take two minutes and talk, discuss with your neighbor, which is the best option? Just take 60 seconds to discuss which of these three options would be the best. Forty-five seconds left. What's the best option? We need money. We want to have schools, roads, jobs, opportunity. Want to have a sustainable economy. No. Want to invest in infrastructure. Twenty seconds.
to be the first person in all the time I've ever, ever done this. Be the first one. Who has ever said option one? Option three. But that's fine. Whenever I've done this demonstration, there's always public conversation about option number one or option number two. And there might be some discussion about whether there should be some hybrid, you know, kind of understanding around that, right? There are reasons option number one is probably the most preferable. That's principally because you want money created by the public, but you want, also want it to be created for a particular purpose, a public purpose. So you want it to be created by the but you want it to be created. You don't just want to create the money for no purpose, for like, just give it to people, like, give it to Right. So, but anyway, there will be discussions about option number one and option number two. But Doc Hunter notwithstanding, <laughs> no one ever says it is best to have an economy that is sustainable by going with number no one ever says that. No one ever says we should allow that guy <laughs> to create our money for us and we pay him for the benefit and privilege of creating our money. Because like this right here, y'all, is really affecting us at the terrestrial level. This is like where the rubber hits the ground. And the reason is because if we allow him to create the money, it will change the nature of the money. And I need you to get this. Because in options number one and two, money is the servant of the people, the community. The money is being created to facilitate the needs of a community. To invest in infrastructure, create roads. It is being created to build schools, provide jobs, opportunities so people can have the money that they need to do stuff. But in option number three, it changes the nature of the money. And rather than the money being a servant of the people, the people now become a servant of the money. And they now have to hunt and fish and cook and sing and work and get paid at the end of the week not to earn money for themselves, but they've got to earn money to pay that guy. <laughs> when they get their check on, fr on Friday, they are not just, they can't use the bulk of their money to go to the movies, to buy food, to buy medicine. They gotta use the bulk of their money and spend all of their effort, labor, and time. They gotta wake up every day at five in the morning, leave at six, drive an hour and 45 minutes in traffic, get off at 4.30, spend another hour and 45 minutes in traffic, get home, tired, worn out, got to do it all over again to get a check on Friday with all these taxes taken out. When what's left, they can't even use most of it for themselves. They got to use it to pay back that enterprising individual <laughs> who some way have the unmitigated goal <laughs> to convince Trust him to create our money. And so it changes the nature of the money. We're now slaves to the money. But not only that, more importantly, all of this interest that we're paying is siphoning the wealth of the community 
into the financial sector. And we can become beholden on his benevolence. Like, we all have to, we, every person, it's like here in the vacuum. It's like sucking the money. It's all been sucked to him. And then in order for us to do stuff going forward, we are now beholden to his benevolence. To like, I don't know, give us something back. Invest back. And when he invests, when he buys our bonds, it starts the cycle all over again. And that process of what economist Michael Hudson calls rent extraction, it's rent extraction because what he's doing is he's renting us the money. And that process leads to rent extraction or wealth extraction. It is, it is taking our wealth and concentrating it into his pocket. And what that does is it leaves us to compete now for insufficient economic resources. It now makes our economy like musical chairs, where there are not enough chairs in the game. And if we want to address poverty, inequality, injustice in the world today, we can't just change the diversity of the people in the few chairs that we have. We need more chairs. Every time I do this, I, as we did here on the stage not long ago, I will put 10 chairs on the stage with 10 people and we'll play musical chairs. I'll play music. I'll say, walk around these chairs. When the music stops, whoever gets the chair, I'll give you $100. And when the music is playing with 10 chairs, with 10 people, I need y'all to get now why I'm so passionate about this. When they walk around 10 chairs with 10 people, they're pleasant. Their people are happy. They're smiling. It's peaceful. And when they sit down, I give them all a hundred dollars. They smile, man. It's like, oh, this is what's up. Then I ask them to stand up and I remove four, five, or six chairs. And I say, walk around these chairs. Same people, church going to be. <laughs> Bible believing, tongue talking people, church going to be. Say, walk around these chairs. Six chairs for ten people, four chairs for ten people. I say, you know, these are the rules, right? You know, it's easy rules, right? Anybody can make it, right? Yeah. Just walk around this chair, the whole dynamic changes. The energy is totally different. There's suspicion, anxiety. I mean, it's like you can set blood pressure. In. <laughs> then when the music stops, there's pushing, shoving, there's alliance building. The younger, those who think they're stronger, can kind of body out those that they think are weaker. Why? Why do they do that? Is it because they're mean now? Is it because they're devils? Is it because, is it because they're hate-filled? It's because they've been forced to survive in a context of insufficient resources. The chair is the resource. And changing the race, gender, religion, <coughs> sexual orientation, class of the people in the chairs sounds good. And we need but if you don't add more chairs, you continue the politics of competition and infighting. And if we want to have a peaceful world, a world where there is truly opportunity, it would be wrong for the people who make it in the chairs to look at the six people who don't make it in the chairs and say, you know what? If y'all would just be like me. You know, I pray. I read my Bible. 
I went to school and got an education. There's no amount of education, legislation, hard work, prayer, fasting that can account for the reality of the economic scarcity. We don't need another. It's, it's, it's the economic reality. And, and lifting up before people the ideal black person. Oh, look what they did. Look at him. Look at her. The first, you know, whatever. Look at him. Went to, went to college. Went to graduate school. If he can make it, you can make it. That's, that's, what they, that's what he wants us to think. Because he's sporting all the chairs. And if we're going to have a community of opportunity, we've got to build a movement of people who are committed to putting more chairs on the stage. Yeah. Everything that's awesome. that all of the economic instability that we witness as a result of following option three allows him to profit on making the coin out of nothing. On all of these, these examples, the money is just going to be created out of nothing. Right? We started the island of Wakanda. Either the community is going to create it, spend it out of nothing. Or that guy is just going to walk around and get some rocks with, uh, and create it out of nothing. He is profiting. He is receiving an unearned economic benefit on work he has not performed. The, probably the laziest industry in America that receives the most welfare is the financial industry. Because they make trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars according to the mechanics of modern money. On credit, they created out of nothing. Now, I mean, some people look around, wow, what are you talking about? Yeah. When you get your mortgage, how many have a mortgage? Okay, that's a lot of people. <laughs> if I were to ask, Crystal, when you got your mortgage, 400000 600000 $700,000 mortgage, and you were so happy because you got your mortgage. This is what Clinton told us to do in the 90s. You know, get a house. It's the American dream. If I ask you, when you got your mortgage, where did the bank get that money from? Some of y'all have been with me a while, so you know the answer. But most people, if you ask them, when you go to the bank and you get the $400,000 mortgage, where did the bank get that money from? They will say, oh, I guess from the bank. You say, what do you mean? I guess there's a vault like savings. What banks do is they aggregate the deposits of savers and then they loan it to people who want to borrow money. They keep a portion of the interest that spread and that's how they make everybody. It's called the loanable funds theory that banks are intermediaries of existing money. And that's what he wants us to think, because it kind of legitimizes his business if the public thinks and believes that all he's doing is just lending money. But when you read the mechanics of modern money, they did not loan you existing money. Think about it. Think there's no way they could loan to you demand deposits because it's a demand deposit. If you put your deposit in a bank, you, that means if it's a demand deposit that you can go there anytime and get what? Get your bank. If you go to a coat check, put your coat in there, and they give you a ticket, and you come back an hour later and say, I'd like my coat, they, don't, they can't tell you come back tomorrow. So if they will, it, it doesn't even make sense to say they loan me existing money. I'm gonna get your questions at home. To loan me existing money, because I want to let folks go, you know, soon I've been talking. I really want you to get my heart on this. It's created out of nothing. It's created out of nothing. 
And, and you just get so happy. You come to Bible study and testify. I got, I got, I got low on my, I don't know how I got it. <laughs> and we start telling testimonies like, we praise, I don't know, I didn't qualify for it. I didn't have the fire score. I didn't have the revenue. And we shout praise God. And then you, whether it's a single household or household, you go away for 30 years. Wake up at 5 in the morning. Leave home at 6. Spend an hour and a half in traffic twice a day. And you do that for 30 years. And in 30 years, you will have paid $1.4 million. To that guy. Somebody said to that guy. <laughs> and he smiled. Because <laughs> he don't take your 1.4 million. He might invest it to look for opportunities. Just imagine what your family could have done. You talk about wealth creation, wealth building. Just imagine what. Your family, our families could do with that $1.4 million over 30 years. You probably, I mean, what did you do with it? What did you, what, what did you, you can't even think about it because you haven't even, you can't even imagine. Start a business, right? You could go on a vacation. Buy an item, okay, she <laughs> Come on, what would you do with that? You have wealth, you have resources, you have assets and not liabilities. If you could give it, you could pass it down to your children and your children's children. And, 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 and the funerals would be totally different. The funerals would be totally different. If the children and the grandchildren are down here on the front row and they close that and they look at they look in the casket, they gonna shed a tear, they gonna close the casket, and they gonna celebrate your home. Because you left them an inheritance. You left them opportunity. Well, and not bills and murders and just who gonna get the stereo and who gonna get what I'm fixing. <laughs> no, like I need y'all to get this because we are dealing with generational bondage, slavery, because of our understandings of the realities of money that happen not just at the micro household level, but happen at the macro economic level. So we are building a campaign that's called Our Money that is really fundamentally about inviting you to join a movement of citizens of all backgrounds, races, creeds, colors, who are fundamentally about demanding that it's time that we become a community of opportunity, that we re-legitimize the power of money creation for purposes in the public interest, so that rather than relying on a money supply provided by private credit, we, through, through private lending, we can have a money supply based upon public spending. And if we do that, we can solve our greatest challenges, our greatest needs. It is preferable to rely on money created through public spending than private lending. Because according to uh, folks who have looked at this, money created through private lending, 70% of it is created for fixed assets like real estate and stocks. It's like the only way you can get money today is to get a loan for real estate. Think about why there's so much gentrification. I don't even want to go into how all of these neighborhoods, when you drive into D.C. now, you can't even recognize many neighborhoods from around the ballpark, Dr. E. Fay, where you live. I'm like, whoa, like I didn't remember this just a few years ago. Like totally different. And uh, so we're building a community that's about helping us to 
tap into the untapped potential of our economy to solve our greatest challenges. So you might be asking, well, what do I do to help? What do I do? What can I do to help? This has really defined my ministry. I think it's going to define my ministry. We're making tremendous inroads in the back channel conversations we're having with elected officials, with thought leaders and influencers. But we have to build a campaign from the grass up, y'all. Because I told you that we have had generations where we've been operating in a system that's allowed him to aggregate all of our wealth and power. And he's determined to do whatever he can to make sure we don't change. And so elected officials respond to citizens. They respond to us. And the only way to fight this is to be informed and active and realize that if it's going to happen, we don't have to make it happen. If this if it's going to happen, if it's going to happen, we can't just rely on one messianic leader to arrive and let him or her do it. It's going to require all of us to be active, involved, and engaged to make it happen. Somebody called me the other day after seeing our campaign video. They said, you know, I shared your video with a few people. And, you know, you know, some of the responses I've got is, you know, this guy, you know, um, he, he really needs some wins. You know, you know, he's, you know, been involved. In, he really needs some wins. I was like, they really must not really know me. <laughs> we did the Enough is Enough campaign and we won that yeah. you know we fought for marriage equality and inclusion and opportunity for all people yeah. controversial but guess what we won that. and this Goliath here this Philistine giant we're going to take uh, five smooth stones and a slingshot. <laughs> I, mean, I have to believe that. Right? It's going to require your engagement. I want you to educate yourself. I want you to go to our campaign website, ourmoneyus.org. I want you to sign up so that you can stay updated about the things that we're going to be doing. I'm not, I realize that all of you here today may not want to be a part of this campaign and part of this sort of local movement, which we're going around the country, other churches, other pastors, other civic organizations, and I get that. But those of you who desire to be a part of our money, I need you to sign up. Do we need them to sign up outside today or just on the website? I can't hear you too. On the website. All right, go to our website so that we can start organizing. I believe there's a way for all of you to be engaged. Some of you might be in social media. We need a robust social media strategy. We're going to have opportunities where we need to go down to meet with, you know, our members of Congress. Uh, we're going to have to write letters, send emails, saying we want you to support the Green New Deal. And the pay for it is through public spending. And we don't want to have to wait to tax Jeff Bezos or Amazon to do it. We can do it right now. We need public infrastructure for our schools because we're really being weighed down with so many county and state taxes. And we can there's another there's a, a more powerful funding mechanism that's, that can help us have a community of opportunity. Please go to our website. There are opportunity. We're going to have rallies, marches. Uh, uh, we're going to connect with other groups who are talking about a range of issues. So educate yourself by going to our website. There are ten instructional videos on banking that are on our website. Go there. Then we want you to share it. Share what we're doing with other people in your network. Get them involved and ask them to go to our campaign website. Um, we want you to help us. Listen, all of you here today are a part of some network of influencers. And our area of change is that we want to influence the influencers. So some of you are here are part of sororities, fraternities, lodges, social justice, civic organizations, churches, ministers' conferences. We want you to help us build a network uh, in the, in the uh, networks that you're a part of. Uh, perhaps you're a part of some civil rights organization. You have some key relationships. 
Uh, help us to facilitate conversations with leaders uh, in, your, in your influence group. Then we want you to partner with us by helping us to mainstream the core concepts that we've talked about today. I know they're country, I know they are, they sort of require you to think differently about a lot of things that we've been told to think about money, but that's but that's really the major opportunity that I think really provides a huge opportunity to address many of the issues that we care about. We want to mainstream our core concepts by having your office, your organization adopt a resolution. Perhaps you're a part of some civil rights organization. Perhaps your sorority, your fraternity can adopt a resolution on economic progress, ending inequality, uh, economic justice resolution that relates public spending as the funding mechanism, right? And so we can help you to adopt a resolution for your chapter, fraternity, fraternity your government organization, whatever. And then lastly, uh, we want to promote these concepts. We need you to help us use your voice and your influence to meet with members of Congress, members at the state and local level as well. There is a way for state, because you might say, well, the state of Maryland or the, my county, we don't create money at the county level, yes. But if you think differently about money, then you can fund state and local priorities. We had 50 state and local uh, officials here yesterday. If you think differently about money, we don't have to fund state and local priorities through what? Tax revenue or borrowing or floating bonds. With a robust understanding of federal government spending like is possible through the Green New Deal and others, we can fund local priorities, state priorities through an aggressive public spending priority. So rather than individuals being weighed, by, weighed down by taxes in this way, if we change, say that way, if we change, if we change the, way the way we think about money, we can literally change the world. If we change the way we think about money, y'all, we can change the world. We can have a different future. So, uh, help us to promote these concepts by contacting members of Congress at the appropriate time. Some of you are influencers. We want to write opinion editorials, sign statements of support. We're going to have rallies, demonstrations, and organize to support the election. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we've got to elect members of Congress who support the new economics for public finance. At the end of the day, You've got to support members of Congress who support robust public spending on federal, state, and local priorities. And it's got to be more than just lip service. Oh, no, 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 we're not doing that. The same way that the right has defined its issues and narrowly defined it to like two or three issues, abortion, guns, and gays. Abortion, guns, and gays. That's all we care about. Abortion, guns, and gays. No, we have to define the priorities that we care about and hold our elected officials accountable to that. Right? You gotta hold them accountable. accountable. Um, and then, uh, and and I just want to thank all of you for coming today. I mean, I'm just really touched and moved. This is my 15th anniversary at my meeting. Bigger now than it was in 2007. 
and families get, are getting put. That, that just wasn't right to me. And I wanted to understand how that was possible. This is not an academic conversation. It's not an academic conversation. When people don't have food, when people don't have food, People can't pay their bills. I want to be a responsible leader. I don't want to give people these spooky answers. Turn around three times. Yeah. <laughs> throw money on the stage. And by the time you get home, it will go away. It will be gone. No. Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to let the captives free, and to preach. Tanika, did I leave anything out in terms of how those of you, if you desire to partner with us, I certainly want you to sign up. They don't need to sign up in the back. No, just go to the website and sign up and continue to keep us uh, in prayer. Uh, what I'm going to do as we dismiss, I'm going to sit here because there may be a few of you who still have questions about some of the foundational principles and concepts that you know we discussed. There's so much more that I could talk about, and I'll just kind of hang out here for those of you who want to do that. Uh, tomorrow, come on out. It's going to be a great day tomorrow. I'd love to see you. Thank you so much. Wow, I mean, this church is so awesome. Come out tomorrow at 8.45 and 11 a.m. tomorrow. God bless you.